perhaps we could be forgiven if we ever read the news and just want to put the news back down again and walk away. Typically, when I go on vacation, I go to different churches. Sometimes I go to more church services than I usually do because I have a rare opportunity to experience how others are worshiping. Maybe they have some ideas that we could bring back to St. Andrew, I think. But I have a confession to make. When last I went on vacation a few weeks ago, I first went on a retreat with my mother, and then I got to go to Yosemite National Park with Janet and our niece and nephew to do some hiking. And while I was doing those things, I took a break from the news, and I took a break from church. I did engage in daily devotionals, but I took a break from struggling deeply with the biblical texts every week in light of the news of the day, just for a couple weeks. I returned much more ready to dive back in with all of you again. In Matthew chapter 14, Jesus takes a break. Right after Jesus multiplies the loaves and fishes so that thousands could be fed, he sends the disciples ahead of him, he sends the crowds away, and he goes up onto a mountain to pray and is there all night. The Bible says he was there all alone. Now this might not sound very appealing to those of you who have been sequestered in your homes alone for far too long. But to my friends who are parents and who used to be able to escape a little bit by going to work or going out to coffee with a friend or who now find that their house is not only their home but their workplace, their gym, their restaurant, the classroom for their kids and sometimes even a playground, this idea of going up on a mountain alone and staying there for a while <laughs> sounds really nice. In fact, if they did, I imagine they might not want to come back for a very long time. Perhaps some of you can relate to this. But thankfully for the disciples, Jesus did re-engage again after his break. By morning time, he caught up with them in a boat, now battered by the waves with the wind against them. I suppose it's easier when you can walk on water to catch up with those who went ahead. Even Jesus' work and responsibilities did not go away while he prayed and took a break on retreat. What kind of a break do you need? Even if it's just for several hours, like the kind of break Jesus took? And how might claiming that break help you re-engage in whatever you are called to do when you get back? All four gospel passages give examples of how Jesus went off by himself to pray, even when it meant that he could not heal everybody who the disciples wanted him to heal and could, could not do everything that everybody wanted him to do. Of course, being on break, well, that was not where he lived all the time. But in today's gospel passage, Peter advocates that Jesus enter a kind of permanent break, which Jesus refuses to even consider. Jesus had just begun to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. That was the moment where Peter who had just been praised by Jesus for being his rock, took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus did not simply say, oh, Peter, that's so nice that you want to protect me and help to keep me safe, but I've got this, don't worry. No, Peter asked Jesus to take a break or retreat entirely from his central purpose, God's central purpose, 
in no uncertain terms, Jesus lets Peter know that Peter is tempting him in a way that only one other has truly tempted him. Because Peter is enticing Jesus to subtly give up his allegiance to an entirely different power system than the power system of God, Jesus calls Peter by the name that he hasn't referred to anybody else. Jesus' mission had been to bring healing, forgiveness, purpose, and new life to countless people. But all these people were harassed by common underlying human power systems of politics, colluding with economics, colluding with religion. Even now, these entrenched powers were conspiring to put Jesus to death on a cross. Although Jesus might not have preferred it, he would not respond with violence to the violence being used against him. Instead, he was in the process of moving towards completely exposing those domination systems and undercutting the power of their injustice by making it visible, bringing it in the light, into the light for all to be able to see. So it could not have the same kind of power So a different kind of power, the power of love, sacrificial love, could be seen for the greater power that it truly is. This week, Luther Seminary professor Joy J. Moore talked about the importance of working with God to dismantle the systems that make us think we know who we are, the ones, though, that are lies. As she talked about this on a podcast called Working Preacher, along with other Luther Seminary professors this week, it occurred to me that we really are strongly impacted by all kinds of power systems that we didn't create and we became socialized and culturated into before we even could think about what they were. We are enculturated into personal ways of thinking about ourselves that can bind us in, in, in pathways of bad thoughts that do us harm. We have systems, of family systems, in which many people struggle to break free of unhealthy family patterns that no longer serve them, but they can't figure out how to do it differently. And then there are those societal systems that fail to express God's compassion, that fail to give people a second chance, that fail to offer liberation, freedom, new life, love. Joy J. Moore saw in this passage a challenge to us to deny what is familiar, what is comfortable, and the categories that we are used to in order to see the righteousness of God, to see what the inbreaking of Christ means. And she asked, what would it mean for the church today to dismantle everything we are familiar with in order to understand what God has been doing all along? She sees in verse 28 where Jesus says there are some standing here who will not taste death before they will taste the, before they will see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, a vision that we have to work with God to dismantle those systems so that people today can glimpse the kingdom of God and have it not always be a hope that this will happen in the future, but something they can glimpse and taste before they die. As I listened to her, I was reminded that I would not even be standing before you today offering this sermon if it were not for the fact that that is exactly what happened to me two decades ago. I got to taste a vision of that coming of the reign of God still in my lifetime, at a time when I was not sure that it would ever be possible. Many of you and so many others throughout our church worked so hard to dismantle systems that were keeping folks like me from glimpsing the kingdom of God. And having received this gift, it caused me to wonder, how am I being called to pass on this gift to others? As many of you know, 
I was a 27-year-old seminary student in Berkeley when it became clear to me that the ELCA, ELCA policy that precluded pastors and committed same-gender relationships from serving as pastors in the Lutheran church, well, it became clear that was going to preclude me too. I was already imagining at this point that I was now going to need to go back to my first career of high school teaching and begin to pay off tens of thousands of dollars of seminary debt, seminary experience that would never be put to its intended vocational use. That's what I was already starting to think about when an openly gay Lutheran pastor named Jeff Johnson came to speak at the seminary to a group of us, mostly closeted seminarians, closeted even from each other, he told us the only way this unjust policy is ever going to change is if the ELCA can see the harm it is inflicting upon itself. So long as we silently bear the pain within our lives and our bodies, nothing will change. But as more and more of us refuse to walk away, as more and more of us come out and tell the truth to the church we love about who we are, the church will have to see the pain and injustice of what it is doing in the lives of real people. Pastor Johnson said, make no mistake, a lot of us are going to have to get kicked off the clergy roster or be denied approval to serve, and that will be incredibly difficult and painful. But if enough of us, if enough of us come out and stand up, it will eventually change. And then he said, we need as many of you as possible to push the system as far as you can towards love and justice. And when it kicks you out or denies you approval or does the worst of whatever it's going to do, we will be here to catch you. You will not be alone. And that is the way our church will change, he said, to more fully embody the love and justice of God. Pastor Jeff Johnson was calling us to take up our lives, to take up our crosses and follow Jesus, to allow a smaller vision of our lives to die so that we could participate in the big vision of the healing power of Christ for all. It was one of the clearest moments in my life when something which I believe was summoned out of me it summoned me to deny a smaller version of myself and take up my cross in order to rise to a larger vision of myself, the Christ self in community of courageous love with others. Hearing the echoes of Jesus' words in what Pastor Johnson said enabled me to stand with other people of faith and tell the truth about who I was, and more importantly, to tell the truth about the love of God as I knew it, as we knew it, and the justice of God as we longed for it in our lives. In the subsequent years, there were a few dozen times when I thought that participating in an extraordinary ordination of a gay pastor, or going to a retreat with other LGBTQ clergy, or attending a worship service in support of the ordination of LGBTQ people might cause me or one of my colleagues to get shot or bombed. But thankfully, there was never an imminent threat to us. Seeing this passage come up in our lectionary, this, this call of Jesus to take up our cross and follow, caused me to wonder, how do I, who have received the gift of God's grace through the courageous love of others, how do I put my body, my life, my witness now, today, on the line to stand with others who have not tasted that reign of God breaking into their lives as fully as they might? As we know, earlier this week, another black man, Jacob Blake, was shot by a police officer, this time in Kenosha, Wisconsin, he was shot in the back seven times with his three children watching. He's now in the hospital paralyzed from the waist down. People in Kenosha took to the streets. Two protesters were killed and one seriously injured by a white young man who said he had driven to Kenosha from Illinois to protect local businesses. 
This young man then tried to turn himself into police after realizing he had killed somebody, but the police would not arrest him that evening, but gave him a drink of water instead. The difference between the way the two men were treated by police did not escape the attention of the media or Jacob Blake's father, who said, my son is a human, but he is not being afforded the rights of a human. Sometimes you get a little angry, sometimes more than a little angry, because we have been going through this for so long. That 70-year-old Caucasian shot and killed two people and blew another man's arm off, he said, on his way back to Antioch, Illinois. He got to go home. He got water. They gave that guy water and a high five. My son got ICU and paralyzed from the waist down. Those are the two justice systems right in front of you. We do not prescribe violence, he said, and looting. That's not going to bring Trayvon Martin back to Mir Rice. That's not going to make my son get up out of that bed and walk, he said. Since then, we know last night, even in Portland, somebody was shot who was a counter-protester. And this is not going to end in a simple way. Are we just going to retreat from this and so many of the other systems that God longs to have healed? I like the way that Reverend Sherry Dietz of the Episcopal Church of the Trinity in Coatesville, Pennsylvania put it. She said, following Jesus and denying ourselves does not mean giving up our humanness. Rather, it means learning to see what it is within our humanity that hinders us from God and letting that go. It means not clinging to our human desires at the expense of seeking to know God's desires for our human lives. It means finding the path that will best enable us in all the particularities and peculiarities of our lives to find that intersection, that crossing, that cross that Christ invites us to take up where the human and the divine meet in fullness. Just because I have had a few powerful experiences of getting caught up in a larger vision of life such that I was ready to take some level of personal risk in order to live out of that vision with others, friends, does not mean it is easy for me. (laughs) Last night, when Janet and I learned that somebody had been killed in downtown Portland, she started talking about going downtown where her church, First Congregational United Church of Christ, has been hosting a medic station for many weeks. And you might like to think that I would have been patting her on the back and blessing her on her way, saying, yes, honey, go take up that cross of yours. But no, I wasn't. In fact, I told her that both her dog and I preferred that she stay home and stay safe. Fortunately for our relationship, she did not refer to me Satan as Satan and tell me to get behind her. Nonetheless, I suppose that is my white privilege or middle-class privilege, again, reminding me that unlike so many vulnerable people, so many black and brown people and lower-income people throughout the world, I often have a choice about when I will put myself at risk for a larger vision, and I am so grateful that God forgives me every time I fall short. I'm even more grateful that God and Jesus did not turn off the news and accept Peter's call to go home, to go back to the lakeshore, just go become fishermen, turn off the news, and take a permanent break. Just as Jesus reaches out his arms on the cross with love for me in all my failures to work for the true love of God, justice, and healing God longs for, Jesus also makes visible the body of a brown man tortured and killed for no good reason by a system of injustice that has been that was destroying people then under Roman occupation the same system in a different form that has been destroying our country from the inside out through the sin of racism for 400 years this is not going to be solved overnight So if Jesus is any model, we should definitely take breaks from time to time. Head up to the mountain or on retreat, take some extra time to pray, and even turn off the news for a while or sometimes skip going to church 
I mean, it's on video. You can always watch it later, right? But of course, God did not give us this crazy gift of unconditional love and eternal life so that we could go on permanent break or run away. We know who wants to trick us into believing that to be the case. When I remember that I get to stand here before you today because of the countless people who were not willing to settle for unearned societal privileges. If those privileges were made possible by a system that actively did harm to others like me, when I remember that, I feel called to join you in standing up against the systems that do harm, whether they're the personal systems in your own head, the family systems that do harm, or the larger societal systems. Thankfully, those people who stood up for me, many of whom I will never ever know, were empowered by the love of a God who showed up in Jesus and showed them what it looked like to love without limits, to fight for justice for the oppressed, a God who refused to exercise divine privilege by running away. I suppose I and we can be forgiven if from time to time we want to run away or even if we do for a little while. Fortunately for us, God in Jesus didn't run away. Not then, not now, not ever.